morning, good afternoon, good evening, global supply chainers. Welcome to the second Hangout uh, event in Supply Chain Dynamics, SE3X. My name is Eva Ponce. I'm the executive director of the MicroMaster program in supply chain management. And I'm so happy to be part of this uh, global and challenging program. I know you are so motivated, so energetic, and you are working very hard in the MicroMaster program. So I just want to encourage you to keep up the good work and say, go MicroMaster, yeah. <laughs> so uh, today we are celebrating the second Hangout event in Supply Chain Dynamics. Um, we, we are very lucky to have with us Dr. Roberto Perez Franco. Uh, Roberto is the director of the MIT Supply Chain Strategy Lab, and he has been working in supply chain strategy during the last 10 years. So please take advantage of this opportunity to ask Roberto those questions you might have in supply chain strategy. We will focus today in week three, um, we are not going, as you know, not going to answer any administrative questions or midterm questions. We are just going to focus on supply chain strategy. So as in previous Hangout events, we will start with this brief introduction. Today we will focus on two cases study, studies. Um, Laminix, one, one of these cases Laminix, and the second one is Pixel Artist. Both cases you already have in the, in the supplemental material, and I'm pretty sure you, you have already read this case study. So Roberto will introduce a little bit the two cases, and then after this introduction, we want you to move to the breakout session. You will spend 15 minutes in this breakout session, and the idea there is that you are going to have the opportunity to see and be seen by your peers and interact with them in this discussion. After these 15 minutes, we want you to come back to the lobby with your answers to Roberto's questions. And definitely, any other questions you might have uh, related to supply chain strategy. So I hope you enjoyed this, enjoy this event, and please uh, join me in welcoming Roberto. Thank you, Eva. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, these two cases, Laminix and Pixel Artist, are very close to my heart because I uh, not only wrote them, but they are the result of two projects that I conducted, um, one of them recently, the other one some years back. And uh, I am very familiar with them. I conducted like dozens of interviews for each one of these projects and had meetings with the executives from these companies. But I use them here, and I, I also use them in my executive education session and when I teach strategy here to our students at MIT to illustrate certain key concepts. You may remember from the lessons the idea of coverage, the idea of support, and the idea of consistency. Uh, you may remember from the lessons that we explained that a supply chain strategy should have uh, a clear priority between objectives and also that it should be supporting the overall strategy of the organization. So these cases go to test those ideas and uh, give you a chance to try your hand at more realistic situations because these are, even though the names are disguised, these are not the real names of the companies, they are based on real cases. And this uh, way in which the problem is presented which is not like straightforward, it's not linear, there's, it's like a convoluted narrative, is similar to how you may face it when you go to the field and ask people about their companies. So let me say, uh, up front, let me tell you that today we will give you two questions. Uh, I am happy if you, other, if you answer one of the questions, I'll be even more happy, uh, happier if you answer both questions. But feel free to answer only one of the questions if that's all the time that you have. So. Before I introduce each one of the questions, let me tell you about the case that the question refers to. First, in the case of Laminix. Laminix, as you know, is a manufacturer of uh, specialty laminates, and they were approached by one of their major customers, Videoflat, with a proposal that if you can sell me a laminate that is twice as wide, I'll pay you top dollar for that. The only commitment that I need from you is that you'll have it ready within 12 months. Within a year, it should be ready to go because I have this new TV coming that is extra wide and I need the laminate for, to protect the screen. And as you know, Lamini signed this contract. Uh, but they ran into a little bit of a, a problem, which was that the wider laminate in their pilot plant 
that they use for research and development had this uh, problem that is called either lay flat or bowed middle problem where the laminate kind of bends. And this cannot happen in a laminate because it has to be sandwiched between, between two uh, layers of glass. If it bends, then you can have air bubbles and that would be a disaster because you have to throw out, throw out the, the, the screen. So how can laminate solve this situation? Uh, they have a big production plant and uh, one way they can solve this is to stop the big plant and dedicate like a week or a few days of this production plant uh, to troubleshoot the issue of the bowed middle. But because this is a, an expensive plant, as you may remember, Laminix uses the largest extrusion plant in the world. It is not cheap to stop this plant. It is going to also delay production. And to cover your demand over that period that the production is stopped, you will have to build up inventory up front. But inventory is not free. So when you build up inventory, you will have to accrue some inventory holding costs. Also, you will have to sink capital into that inventory that you're building. Plus taking some loss uh, in terms of capacity, capacity because, because the plant was for innovation, innovation instead of production. Because Lapis has this orientation, orientation and you've been efficient and driven, they were very aware of that, was an, that was an option. There was, there was the also the option of maybe trying something in the pilot, pilot, pilot maybe and doing, doing a new, a new uh, production line in the pilot, pilot, pilot was, that was still one still still required in the big plant. So these are options that they had. had. Instead, as you know, in the case, what happened was that the company failed to deliver on its promise to the customer. And the customer left very unsatisfied and found a different supplier who was more flexible because they used mid-sized plants and was able to deliver in a short time what Laminic had promised but was not able to deliver. And you can imagine that Laminic suffered a, a, some lost market share when they were unable to deliver on their commitments. Sorry to interrupt. All of a sudden the sound just went bad for everybody. Um, I don't know why. Yeah. <coughs> Should I... Uh, Hold on for just a second. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, can you just do a test? One, two. One, two, three. Testing. How's that? Yep, okay. Does it sound better? I don't know what it was. All right. Sounds Perfect. Sounds good. All right. So let's proceed. So the question that I have for you regarding the Laminix case is the following. If you were the head of supply chain for Laminix and you are three months into the one year that you have to deliver on the video flat commitment. So three months have elapsed. Your pilot plant has already been able to produce this wider laminate in the pilot plant. But you run into the problem when you try to, to scale it up into the big production plant. Okay, So you run into that problem of the bowed middle, and you're the head of supply chain. The question for you is, how should you address this issue? What would you recommend as the head of the supply chain for Laminix? How, what would you recommend that Laminix do in order to deliver on the contract that they have with VideoFly? For example, you can suggest we have to stop the big plant and use it for to troubleshoot, or you can suggest let's, let's uh, overhaul the pilot plant and make it capable of, of doing the, of reproducing exactly the process. Or you can come up with a new alternative. Uh, you can maybe suggest that they talk with video flat into some sort of arrangement or that they subcontract it to adult and other suppliers. So I want to hear what are your ideas. And this is a question that I ask my students all the time. So I want, I want to know what would you suggest. Again, I'm going to repeat the question. And this is one of the questions I would like you to consider. If you're the head of supply chain of Laminix, three months into the 12 months that you have to deliver, and you run, you run into this bowed middle problem, what would you recommend to move forward in order to, so that at the end of the year you have a happy customer? That's the first question. Uh, now, the second question relates to the Pixel Artist case. As a reminder, Pixel Artist is a producer of uh, flat screens. It's unrelated to video flat. Uh, and the funny thing is that in reality, neither one of these companies is in the screen business. This is just that these guys are using. Um, and Pixel Artists produce screens, and they lost the chance of producing screens for phones and for tablets. So they, are, they, are, they have been recently burned. So they promised that they would be on top of the next big thing. And their research, uh, their, the research regarding markets indicates that the next big thing is in the wearables. Now, what is wearables? If I have a necklace that has a little screen showing the photo of my daughter or if I have a, 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 a 
like a, like a necklace or a ring or I have a um, a shirt that gives me the weather, the temperatures, the things that I wear that have electronics. This is not very common right now, but it, it is uh, perceived along with the Internet of Things as being one of the candidates for the next big thing in, in electronics. So Pixel Artist promises we want to be a leader in the wearables uh, segment. They don't want uh, to suffer again uh, missing the boat. So they create a new business unit. You may remember from the lesson when we discussed that a corporation can have its corporate strategy, but then the business unit has its business strategy, right? So Pixel Artist as a corporation creates a business unit that is the wearable business unit, and it gives these wearable business units a single mission. And this mission is to make sure to become a leader in the wearable uh, market, which is, by the way, a new market. It's a market that is characterized by high speed uh, very fast rate of innovation. Innovation can come from anywhere. A guy in, in, the, in his garage or can be making the next big thing. Um, IP is very fragmented and so on. Um, so how think about how can the wearables business unit fulfill this mission of becoming a leader in the, in the wearables market? A market that has no clear leader a market where names are not very important, when it doesn't matter that you are the big pixel artist, nobody cares that you are pix a pixel artist. So how can the wearable business units deliver on this promise, right? Uh, that's, the, that's the challenge, but that's not the, that's not the exact question that I want you to consider. The question is the following. In delivering this mission, the wearable business unit took a decision that was not well perceived inside the company. It was to go alone regarding their supply chain strategy. Uh, within Pixel Artists, there was, a, there was a corporate supply chain group that had already formulated a corporate level supply chain strategy using a series of preferred suppliers. But, Pixel, uh, but wearables, the wearables business unit decided not to use these preferred suppliers. And the corporate supply guys were not happy with this. They felt slighted, they felt that they should have been given a seat at the table, they felt that they should have been told earlier in the cycle of each product that has been developed about the needs for that product so that they could suggest suppliers so that they could suggest replacement components and they could have a say because they could save money for the wearables business unit so that's what they felt but wearables was not playing ball with them and here's the question that i want you to consider was the wearables business unit justified in pushing aside the tried and tested strategy that the corporate group had developed for the core business of the of the company. I'm going to repeat that question. Was the wearables business unit justified in ignoring the strategy for supply that the corporate group had defined for the core business? Because if you remember from the case, wearables said, we want to do it our way. Were they justified in doing that? So you have two questions now before you. Uh, try to answer at least one of them in your group. If you can cover both, even better. But uh, I, I assume that some groups will prefer one over the other. That's fine. First question, how would you, what would you recommend if you're the head of supply chain for Laminix and you're three months into the uh, production of this new laminate and you run into the bow, the bow middle problem, what would you recommend to have a happy video flat at the end? The second question related to the other case is, was the wearable business units of pixel artists justified in ignoring the corporate supply strategy uh, of using preferred suppliers and instead going on their own way? So those are the two questions. I think they should be clear by now. And we can then uh, go to the breakout rooms. Definitely. Thank you, Roberto. We are so happy to have you here and discuss these two amazing case studies with you. So now it's time to move to the breakout room. So please go to the breakout room and in 15 minutes, we will come back to the lobby. Thank you. <laughs>